Hi everyone, uh, this is Rafiq Suleiman and I work as a networking systems engineer for Dell Technologies and in today's video I'm going to explain how you can easily configure VXLANs and BGP EVPN on Dell EMC switches but before doing that let's explore first what is a VXLAN and how it can be used to overcome most of the problems we had in the past with the legacy switching methods. So let's start with a comparison between VLANs versus VXLANs. So VLANs, it was the first networking virtualization. So originally when I have a switch, the switch belongs to one broadcast domain. And by creating VLANs and assigning physical ports to this VLAN, it's like I am reducing this broadcast domain to only the ports belonging to this VLAN as if I have multiple logical switches. VLANs are defined by the IEEE standard 802.1Q and in the layer two headers, we have the VLAN IDs 12 bits, which giving me theoretically around 4,096 VLANs. Some of these numbers, they are reserved and they cannot be used. Versus the VXLAN, VXLAN is more of a framework for a new concept that we call overlay network. And overlay networking is simply allowing us to send layer two traffic, but over layer three networks in the middle. And we're going to see this in more details in the coming few slides. VXLANs are defined by the RFC 7348. And in the VXLAN headers, we have the VNI, or the VXLAN network identifier, and this VNI is 24 bits, giving me the possibility of having up to 16 million VLANs. So let's go a bit uh, deeper, how the VLAN encapsulation is happening and who exactly does the VXLAN encapsulation. So in this example, we have host one, wants to send packets to host two, host one and host two, they belong to the same VLAN. But as you can see, I have a layer three network in the middle. So what will happen here, host one will construct a normal layer two frame and it will send the frame to VTAP A. VTAP A, it will take this frame and it will encapsulate it inside a VXLAN header. So as you can see here in this drawing, between VTAP A and VTAP B, I have what we call the overlay. And you might think about this overlay as a tunnel between VTAP A and VTAP B. So VTAP A does the encapsulation. It adds the VXLAN headers, which we're going to explore just in the next slide. What are the details of this VXLAN header? And then it encapsulates this VXLAN header inside a UDP header and then inside a layer three header with the source IP of VTAP A destination IP of VTAP B, and then the normal layer two headers that we know. So inside the VXLAN encapsulation, what do we have? We have the original frame. Again, the VTAP will take this original frame and it will encapsulate it inside this VXLAN header. So the details about this VXLAN header, it has multiple fields. The VXLAN flags, eight bits, 24 bits reserved bits for the future use, and then the VNI, which is the VXLAN network identifier. And here I need to put my VXLAN ID, and then followed by another eight bits reserved for the future use as well. This VXLAN header again is encapsulated inside UDP. So VXLAN uses UDP as the transport layer, and this UDP is using destination port 4789. So whenever I see a UDP packet with a destination port of 4789, this is a VXLAN header. And again, encapsulated inside a layer three header, which is the source IP of the source VTAP, destination IP of the destination VTAP, and then inside a layer two header. So who does the encapsulation? So very simply, it's the VTAP or the VXLAN tunnel endpoint device that does the encapsulation that we have. So let's see here 
and let's explore why did we come with this VXLAN as an option. So in the traditional or legacy designs that we all know, we used to work with a three tier architecture with, or the access distribution and core. In this model, we have what we call networking pods. So as you can see here, we have three pods and in each pod, we have a certain groups of VLANs. So in this example, if I have a user sitting in one networking pod and this user is moving to another networking pod, very simply, this user needs to get another IP address. And inside the campus, how do I get an IP address? I get an IP address from the DHCP server. So this model was acceptable in the campus where the main focus is the north to south traffic. But in the data center now, we found that this is not a very suitable model. And that's why we came with a new architecture which we call the spine and leaf or the CLOS architecture. So let's explain this spine and leaf and what's uh, the idea and architecture behind it. If you want to really understand the spine and leaf architecture, think about a chassis. Inside the chassis, a data center chassis, what do I have? If I have a big data center chassis switch, it has line cards, multiple line cards, and then these line cards are connected to the back with fabric cards. So if I have a chassis and I want to have more ports, then I add more line cards. Then if I need more throughput, then I add more fabric cards. So the spine and leaf architecture is exactly like this, but in a more distributed way. So you can think of the fabric card as your spine switches, and you can think of the line cards as your leaf switches here in this case. So very simply, if I have a rack of servers, then on top of the rack, you have a couple of top of the rack switches from the name, and this is what we call the leaf switches. If I have multiple racks of servers, then how can these racks talk, talk together? Then I need to have the spine switches. So spine switches, connects multiple racks together. And definitely we have uh, like 40 gig or 100 gig uplinks going to all the spines that we have. And we might dedicate a couple of top of the rack switches as what we call border leaves. And this is where we connect our services like the firewalls, like the load balancers and going outside of this to the outside world. So the spine and leaf or the CLOS architecture. So you will be surprised that this architecture was invented by Charles CLOS in 1952. And definitely at that time, this was not invented for networking. It was invented for circuit switching telephone at that time. But a consortium of companies, one of them is Dell, took this concept of the CLOS architecture and came with the spine and leaf architecture. In the spine and leaf architecture, in order to eliminate the problems we had in the past from the three tier architecture, so here it's based on layer three architecture, which means that all the connections from the leaves to the spines, they are layer three. And definitely I can leverage ECMP to load balance between the multiple spines that I am connected to. Leaf switches, they connect N devices, here in this case, like servers, like load balancers, like firewalls, and spine switches, they aggregate leaf switches together. And we have a rule that says that every leaf switch must be connected to all the spine switches that I have. And the difference, like what we mentioned, between the spine and leaf and the three-tier architecture in the spine and leaf the focus is more of the east-west traffic versus the focus of north to south traffic in the three-tier architecture. So that's an example of a spine and leaf connection where I have multiple racks and within these multiple racks, I have my top of the rack switches acting as leaf switches connected to spine switches. And as we mentioned, I have pure layer three in between this spine and leaf architecture. 
So in order to have here a routing so these devices can understand and know each other, you can have OSPF or BGP. These are the most two common protocols that uh, usually we use for the spine and leaf architecture. So here in this case, what happens is I have the VTEP devices. As you can see here, I have VTEP number one, VTEP number two, and VTEP number three. How the communication happens? What I need to have, I need to have this logical tunnel from every VTEP to the second VTEP. So in this example, I need to build my tunnel from VTEP number one to VTEP number two. I need to build the tunnel from VTEP number two to VTEP number three. And I need to build the tunnel from VTEP number one to VTEP number three. So here in this case, if uh, I have communication, for example, from rack number one going to rack number two, I use the tunnel between the VTEP number one and VTEP number two. So now the question, how the VTEPs can discover each other? So we have two options here. Either I go and I statically configure the IP addresses of the other VTEPs on my own switch, and that's what we call a static uh, VTEP discovery. Or the second option, I use a new protocol called the BGP EVPN. So it's a new flavor of the BGP that it's called for the Ethernet VPN, and this allows VTEP to advertise themselves and also to discover each other here. So now on VTEP number one, I don't need to mention the IP of VTEP number two or VTEP number three. VTEP number two and VTEP number three, they will advertise their IP addresses and hence VTEP number one will auto discover this IP. And that's exactly what we will be doing in the second lab. So today we're going to have two labs. The first lab we're going to demonstrate how can I configure the static VXLAN configuration. And the next one, we're going to see how VTEPs can auto discover each other. So in the next slide, we're going to discuss the lab that we will be doing. So here in this case, to make it very simple, the lab is over GNS3, so everyone can go and deploy it. I have my top of the rack switch here in every rack, and I have a server connected through VLAN number 100 on Ethernet port 1 slash 1 slash 1. And I have my uplinks, Ethernet 1 slash 1 slash 2, connected to spine number 1, Ethernet 1 slash 1 slash 3, connected to spine number 2, and the same goes for VTAP number 2. And then I will create OSPF, or I will build OSPF. So here it may get a bit tricky. So there is two things here that I need to work on. So first of all, there is the VTEP IP address itself, the remote VTEP IP address. And then how do I reach this IP? So the VTEP IP address can be discovered either statically or dynamically by BGP EVPN. But here in this case, OSPF is what we call the underlay. And the use of the OSPF in order for me to reach the VTEP2 IP address. So OSPF here is not to discover the second IP of the VTEP. OSPF here is just for the underlay, which means once I know the IP address of VTEP number two, either by static configuration or by BGP VPN, how do I reach it? This can be using OSPF. And this part can be a bit tricky here between OSPF and BGP, which routing protocol does what? So again, how VTEP number one will know the IP of VTEP number two, this is based on static configuration or dynamic using BGP EVPN. But once I know the IP of VTEP number two, how do I reach it? This is where I need my underlay routing protocol. It can be OSPF, by the way, or it can be the normal BGP with address family IP version 4 also that we know. So what will happen here once I detect or I know about my VTEP? So from VTEP number one in the first lab, 
we're going to go and configure statically the IP of VTAP number two. And now I can go and build the tunnel between VTAP number one and VTAP number two. And here in this example, we are going to use VXLAN number of 2000. So in the coming slides, I'm going to show you the steps. What are the steps that we are going to go and configure it inside our lab? So first of all, the VTAP IP is always on a loopback. So interface loopback one, then you specify the IP address of your loopback. It should be reachable through routing. And that's exactly what we call the underlay routing. And that's why I advertise the loopback IP within my underlay, either OSPF or the normal BGP. And then you specify the VXLAN configuration. So here with this one, NVE, which is the network virtualization edge, under NVE you specify source interface loopback, which means whenever I'm going to send any VTAP packets, I'm going to use the IP of loopback number one. And then for the VXLAN creation, I create what we call a bridge domain, here, I will give it 2000. To make it simple, I'll give it the same number of the VXLAN. And then the VXLAN VNI IP address is, sorry, ID is 2000. And in the static VTAP configuration, you configure it this way. Remote VTAP, and you specify the IP address of the second VTAP that you want to reach. So here, I statically configure the IP, but then how do I reach? this VTAP IP, this will be through OSPF. So I create the interface VLAN. So now on Dell switches, how do I create VLANs? This is the command. So interface VLAN 100 is the command that we use to create the layer two VLAN. So you will tell me, so what if I want to create an SVI or a layer three uh, VLAN? It's the same command, interface VLAN 100, and then I put an IP address if I want under the switch. So for this one here, we just want to create VLAN 100. And again, that's the command. And then I go under the physical interface, interface Ethernet 1 slash 1 slash 1, switch port mode access to make the port as access, which means belongs to one single VLAN, and then switch port access VLAN 100. I believe most of you will be knowing these commands. And then interface VLAN 100, let me associate it with the virtual network 2000 that I have created. And finally, do not forget to increase the MTU because as you saw from the first slides of this video, that VXLAN adds some headers inside the normal layer two frame. And that's why here you must enlarge the MTU packet here. So here to make it simple, we make it to the uh, largest number MTU 9216. And then you create OSPF, the underlay routing protocol so that you can reach the VTAP IP address. So this is the configuration on the Dell EMC switches, router OSPF one, and then you give it a router ID. Interface Ethernet 1 slash 1 slash 2, if you remember, this is the interface connecting to spine number 1. Definitely here I have an IP address and I have uh, uh, this one connected with a reachable IP on the other side. And I, I enable OSPF, so I, IP OSPF 1 area 0. And then the second interface IP OSPF 1 area 0 as well. And finally, interface loopback 1 in order to advertise this loop back into OSPF so the other VTAP now can reach my VTAP. And before going into the slides, let me give you just a couple of examples of uh, the Dell EMC leaf and spine switches that we always recommend. So a perfect example of a leaf switch is a switch that we call Dell EMC S5200 series switches. So we have multiple options from this switch. The first option it's called S5248. And this one is a one rack unit switch having 48 ports of 10 slash 25 gig, which means all the ports, they can be 10, even one if you want, or 10 gig or 25 gig. And the uplinks of this switch is, 
I have four ports of 100 gig and I have two ports of 200 gig with the standard protocol QSFP, QSFPD, double D or double density, which is uh, the double of 100 gig, which is the 200 gig. This switch is a full line rate switch and the throughput of this switch is a four terabit switching. So in this example, if I have in my rack, I need more number of ports, then very simply, you can go from this one, S5296, almost double of the previous switch, 96 ports of 10 slash 25 gig with eight ports of 100 gig uplinks that goes into uh, the spine switch. This is a full line rate as well, up to 6.4 terabit of switching. And finally, for the spine switches here, we have this Z9264 switch, which comes in a two rack unit form factor, 64 ports of a full 100 gig interfaces. This one again is a full line rate switch that can go up to 12.8 terabit of switching. So usually this one works very, very well uh, as uh, a spine switch that can connect theoretically up to 32 racks coming directly into this spine switch. And usually we have at least two spine switches giving me around uh, more than 25 terabit of switching. So for this one, that's the first part here. The next part, we're going to go into our lab and we're going to see how I can easily uh, configure this configuration. We're going to start with the static configuration and then the next we're going to configure the BGP eVPN. All right, so let's get started. So as mentioned in the first lab, we're going to do the static VXLAN configuration and to explain the lab what exactly the steps that we're going to do. So we have uh, a spine and leaf architecture. So we have VTEP number one or leaf number one will be VTEP number one and leaf number two will be VTEP number two. So on leaf number one, we have a server of 192.168.100.10. This should be in VLAN 100. And from leaf number one, we have ethernet one slash one slash two connected to spine number one and ethernet one slash one slash three connected to spine number two. VTEP number one should use interface loopback one and the IP address should be 200.200.200.1. So for the sake of the time here, I have pre-configured leaf one, spine one, and spine two, and we're going to see the full configuration from scratch of leaf number two, which is VTAP number two. So again, I have the server connected on ethernet one slash one slash one. So on 192.168.100.20, that's the IP address, I need to configure a loopback one of 200, 200, 200.2, and that will be my uh, VTAP IP address. And then ethernet one slash one slash two connected to my spine one, ethernet one slash one slash three connected to my spine two, and we're going to use VXLAN ID of 2000. So this is the lab that I have pre-configured here. So we have uh, using GNS3, so leaf one connected to both spines and the same for leaf two. So as you can see here, if I connected to server number one or server number two, I have specified the IP address. Let me ping 192.168.100.20 and the ping should not be successful. And the same from the other side, 192.168.100.10 the ping should not be successful here. So let's build the configuration. And after the configuration, we should be able to successfully ping, uh, the two servers can ping each other. So let's bring the switches. So as mentioned, I have done the, the configuration on leaf one uh, and spine one and spine two. So let's do the configuration from scratch on leaf number two. So at the beginning, you go to the switch config T to start the configuration. Host name leaf2 
to change the device host name to leaf number two. Then I configure the loopback, so interface loopback one, and then I specify the IP address of 200.200.200.2 slash 32. As you all know, the loopback usually takes slash 32, and then you enable the loopback and you exit. And then I configure my network virtualization edge, so NVE, and then under this one I specify, so for the VTAP IP address, I'm going to use my loopback, so in this case loopback number one that I have just created. And then I configure the bridge group, so virtual network 2000, it will have VXLAN ID of 2000, and now this is very important. So in the lab of the static configuration as mentioned, I need to go and statically configure that for this one, my remote VTAP is going to be 200.200.200.1. And as you can see here, if I went on leaf number one, I have already pre-configured this same configuration. So virtual network 2000, remote VTAP 200, 200, 200 .2, which is the loopback IP of um, leaf number two. And again, if I check the configuration, interface loopback 200, 200, 200 .1. So that's my VTAP IP address that I am using here on leaf number one. I did exactly the same on leaf number two, and I statically assigned the remote VTAP of 200, 200, 200.1. All right, I then I exit and then I create VLAN 100. So interface VLAN 100, as I mentioned during the theory, this is the command to create an interface VLAN on Dell EMC switches. So interface VLAN 100, if I type do show VLAN, I will see that I have created an inter a VLAN called 100. It's inactive because I did not assign any interface. So I need to go and assign interface ethernet one slash one slash one which is the one connected to the server and i can say that interface ethernet one slash one slash one switch port mode access and then switch port access vlan of 100 and that's how i assign uh, uh, the, the interface to a specific vlan and then i go under vlan 100 here and I say that this interface VLAN 100 or this VLAN 100 is part of this bridge domain of 2000. So this will be my uh, bridge domain, how I will use my VXLAN of 2000 here. I simply need to bound the VLAN 100 to virtual network 2000 or VXLAN 2000. And then I go and enable uh, OSPF, so router OSPF one i assign a router id so router id 200.200.200.2 which is the loopback ip that i have created and then i go and configure the uplinks going to the spine switches so interface ethernet one slash one slash two if you want you can even give it a description so you can remember so description this interface is connected to spine number one so I give it a description and then no switch port to make the interface as a layer three. And then I enlarge the MTU and that's the command MTU9216 and I assign the IP address. So here in this case, IP 20.1.1.0 slash 31. So because we're using here point to point interfaces, we are using slash 31 and then no shutdown to enable the interface and I need to add this interface under OSPF. So IP OSPF one area zero. And I will do exactly the same for, for uh, ethernet one slash one slash three connecting me to spine number two. So interface ethernet one slash one slash three. I can put a description. So very similar description here connected to spine number two no switch port, enlarge the MTU 9216, and then I assign the IP address. So the IP here is 
dot one dot two dot zero and also slash thirty one. I enable the interface and I enable OSPF under the interface. So OSPF area zero. So like this, I have enabled both interfaces. The remaining step is to enable the loopback interface under OSPF in order to advertise this to the other VTAP. So interface loopback one IP OSPF one area zero. So again, I specify or I configured manually the static VTAP, which is over uh, interface loopback one. But how will I reach this VTAP? How the other VTAPs can reach me? This is why I configure OSPF. So let's check now if OSPF is working fine. So do show IP OSPF neighbors. So I can see here that I have two devices connected to me in a full neighborship. 40.1.1.1, that's spine number one. 50.1.1.1, that is spine number two. And if I put, do show IP route to check my IP routing, I will find that I have 200.200.200.1. I can see this one through OSPF. So I have learned this interface through OSPF, right? So now let's go and check if the VXLAN tunnel is up and running now. So I go on my switch and I put the command do show NVE remote VTAP. And that's exactly what I should see. I should see that remote VTAP 200, 200, 200 .1 using VXLAN of 2000, it's up. So now if I went back to my servers and I again tried the ping again, the ping should be working fine. So again, let me go to my servers, server number one, and let's go to server number two. Let's again now try the ping. Here you go, the ping should be successful. And again, from the second server, I can try the ping and the ping should be successful. So that's how easily I can configure the first lab of the VXLAN static configuration that we did here. So that's exactly was the lab that we did. And now the two servers, they can ping each other. So in the next lab, we're going to see how can I configure the BGP EVPN lab so I don't need to statically configure the VTAP. This needs to be advertised and auto discovered. So that's the next video. All right, so this is the second lab with the BGP EVPN. And here things, they really get very, very interesting. And this is where I believe the fun will begin. So in the BGP EVPN, all what needs to happen here. So instead of doing the static remote VTAP configuration on VTAP number one. So I went on the switch and I removed the VTAP remote VTAP configuration or the remote VTAP IP of the other VTAP. And using the BGP EVPN, I should learn the two VTAPs, they should learn automatically about each other. Something else will happen here that I will even learn through BGP EVPN about the MAC address of the device connected here without any data traffic. Just if this one learns about the MAC address here, it will advertise the MAC address to the other one through BGP EVPN. So let's get started. In order to have BGP, you need to have some attributes for BGP. So here on this one, I'll configure the BGP 65001 uh, autonomous system. And for the spine switches, usually they are in the same autonomous system. So it will be BGP 65002. And on the other uh, remote VTAP, it will be BGP autonomous system 65000 of three. So let's get started. So before doing anything, let me check if I can ping. So I'm pinging the other one here. After removing the command of the VTAP, I should not be able to ping. So once I do the configuration, then I'll go back and I should be able to ping the other device from the other side. So let's get started. So again, let me go to this is leaf number one, leaf number two, spine one and spine number two. All right. So on leaf number one now, what will be the configuration that I need to do for the BGP? So 
First of all, I need to have another loop back that will be my uh, BGP IP address or uh, ID. So interface loop back zero. So please pay attention. That's not the loop back that I'm using for my VTAP. For my VTAP, I was using loop back one. So this loop back zero, I'm going to use for the BGP neighboring. I will put an IP address 2.2.2.2 slash 32 and then no shutdown. And I enable OSPF under this interface in order for me to also advertise this loop back through OSPF. And then I go to the BGP configuration. So router BGP 65003. Right. Please pay attention now to the configuration of the BGP. So router ID of 2.2.2.2, .2 which is my uh, loopback for the BGP here. And then what will I do here is neighbor 40.1.1.1. .1 this is the spine one. So neighbor 40.1.1.1 .1 on this one here, I will specify that this neighbor and since I'm using the loop back, because usually uh, in eBGP connection, so between the leaf and the spine switches, this is eBGP. eBGP means from different autonomous systems. Usually in eBGP, I use the physical IP of the interface. Since now I'm using the loop back of my device, then I need to increase what we call the eBGP multi hop. So here it should be two or three. So here to be in safe side, I'll make it eBGP multi hop for remote autonomous system, which is the spine switches autonomous system 65002. And then you need to make sure that you're sending the extended community, which means sending the attributes or attaching the attributes to the updates or the BGP updates that you're sending to your uh, neighbors. So send community extended and then update source loop back zero, which means when you're sending any BGP packet, please take the IP of loop back zero. And again, usually this is done in IBGP. If I'm doing it in eBGP, then do not forget, please, to put this command eBGP multi hop increasing more than two or more than three. And then no shutdown to enable this neighbor. What is very, very important here is now I am configuring BGP only for BGP AVPN. Anything else for the underlay, which means to reach my VTAP IP address, this is done through OSPF. So what I will do here is I will go to the address family of IP version four on the switch and I will say no activate, which means I don't want to run BGP IP version four, the normal flavor of BGP, because here I'm relying on OSPF in order to reach my underlay. But what I will do is I will go to address family, which is called layer two VPN, which is the flavor of the BGP VPN. And then I will say activate. So what exactly I'm doing here? I am only enabling this neighbor called 40.1.1.1 .1 as a BGP VPN neighbor only. What about the underlay here? I am relying on OSPF. Another people might do it the other way. They can also rely on BGP for the underlay. And in this case, they will need to enable the IP version four. But here, because I want to show the two differences. So OSPF is running the underlay. BGP VPN is running the overlay. So that's the first neighbor I have here. Let me go and configure the second neighbor, which is spine number two. So 50.1.1.1. .1 and again, eBGP multi hop of four because I am using my loop back. This is in remote autonomous system 65002. I enable the extended community to send my BGP VPN attributes. Update source loop back of zero, the one I have created. No shutdown to enable this neighbor. And then address family IP version four. And then I will say no activate to disable IP version four, but address family of the layer two AVPN here, 
this one what I want to activate. So this is, I have configured here my two neighbors now. The command that is just missing here is what we call uh, the AVPN or the root targets. So if you recall from the MPLS VPNs, you need to specify the root targets in order for you to be injecting certain root inside a certain VRF. So here in this case, what I'm going to do, so I go to EVPN command and I say O2 EVI. O2 EVI means that please auto generate for me here, auto generate for me what will be my root targets. So let's see what will happen with this configuration. So now let me check my BGP configuration. So do show IP BGP and then what kind of BGP that you want to see. If I type do show IP BGP summary, I should not see any neighbors because I am not configuring any IP version 4 address family. But if I type the command do show IP BGP layer 2 VPN EVPN and let me put summary here, I should see here that I have two neighbors. I should see spine 1 and spine 2. And as you can see here, I am only having BGP EVPN neighborship between me and spine number one and spine number two. So let's put some show commands here. Do show EVPN here and then EVI. So what's happening here? So that's a very, very nice command. So when I put on this command here, I can see that I am using 2000, that's my VXLAN ID. The status is up, that's my bridge domain. So the root distinguisher here is 200, 200, 200.2, but the root targets is 0 0.65003 and then the number. So I am adding here the autonomous system for the auto generated root target. So if you can check here now, I cannot discover the other remote VTAP. Why? Because if I went on the other one and I check the same command, do show EVPN, EVI, you will see it's exactly the same. I cannot see the other one or the other VTAP here. Why? Because the root target here is different. So how can I enable this feature now? So I need to go to my EVPN and I need to say disable this root target autonomous system number. So once I click on this one, let me back check the configuration now. So what will happen here? Can you see? So now this root target has zero here. And now I remove the autonomous system here. So this root target now has also zero. And that's how now I discovered that I can see 200, 200, 200 .1 which is, if you remember, the remote VTAP IP address. I did not need to configure it here manually. I configured it here through the BGP EVPN. So I can put the command do show virtual network here summary. So I can see that there is one virtual network configured. Now, the very interesting thing, how do I learn about the MAC addresses and how do I advertise it? So if I put the command do show, EVPN MAC addresses. So here you will see I have this MAC address as remote, as you can see here, without any pings. I can have this one as remote, which means I already learned about the remote MAC address on this one. And now, how do I reach this MAC address? I can reach it through this remote VTAP. And this is my local MAC address here. So as you can see here now, if I went on my PC number one and I did the ping, the ping definitely should be successful. And the same for PC number two. If I went on PC number two and I did the ping, the ping should be successful. So as you can see from here in this lab, what we did, we simply did the BGP EVPN configuration. And in the second lab, we demonstrated how the VTAPs can auto-discover each other. 
through BGP EVPN. So BGP EVPN is running in here in the overlay and in the underlay, I still have OSPF in the background will make my VTEPs reachable from both directions here. And that's it for this video and thank thanks a lot for watching.